All right, here's the second video in the series on Europe stuff. This one's about the population geography of Europe, the political geography of Europe, and the cultural geography of Europe. It's a lot of different things, but it all fits together nicely. The population of Europe, it's one of the most densely populated places in the world because it's been industrialized and urbanizing for the longest. It is highly urbanized, which means the, the majority of people live in cities, and in fact a super high percentage of them live in cities compared to other places in the world. Um, and those large cities then serve as centers of culture and trade, and you've heard of lots of them, like London and Paris and uh, also Rome and uh, maybe Vienna and other places like that. But what's interesting is it all comes from this one word, urban, which is a Latin word, and it goes to urbane, which means like high class and very well organized, and urbanization, which is more and more people moving into cities, but also urban sprawl, perhaps you've heard of, where cities start to reach out and expand farther and farther, and then those regions that they cover are then called urbanized, and then over here on its sad own is rural, which is separate, and a lot of times uh, cities have separate cultures from rural areas, and you know that from the United States, perhaps. So here's the cities that you, these are some major cities in Europe, London, Paris, Rome, Athens, and we're going to talk about the site, like why they are the place that they are. So London is in an area where a river narrowed, because then boats would stop there and that was a prime place for trade. Paris is on an island, which was both good for defense and also an area where you could control trade up and down a river. So there's a theme here with rivers and trade. Rome and Athens, though, this was the center of the Roman Empire, and Athens was a center of Greek, uh, Greek city-state. Uh, they were both built on hilltops, which is a method of defense and also a tradition in that Greek and Roman system of uh, setting up cities. And Greece and Rome are worth knowing about because that's the origin of the ideas of democracy that we use today. Because Greece was the birthplace of democracy, and then the early Roman Republic... It, democracy is a kind word, but we in the United States have a republic that's in some ways more similar to the way the Romans had it set up. Um, they had an indirect democracy. Athens, the people literally voted on on the new laws, and then in Rome, uh, they had representatives who voted on laws, and then eventually emperors. That's not the point. Europe, though, it's not just Roman and Greek culture, and it's not just British culture, it's not French culture. It's lots of different cultures together, and languages, and ethnic groups, and customs. Um, and most people in Europe are Christians, and that's what used to tie Europe together entirely, but there nowadays are lots of different kinds of Christians. And also, there's a significant Muslim population in uh, many places in Europe. And European culture, though, isn't just limited to Europe, because it's spread everywhere, to lots of different parts of the world. But back in Europe, before we talk about how it spread, we're just going to talk about the conflicts generated by these lots of different groups in Europe. Um, because the many ethnic groups and types of religion, uh, there have been, it says several conflicts. There's a crud ton of conflicts to talk about, but we're going to focus on two. So there's an ethnic and religious conflict in the Balkans that went from 1992 to 1995. It's not like it's gone away uh, forever or permanently or entirely, but it was really bad during those years. And there's a long-standing conflict in Northern Ireland that continues to this day, but it's significantly less violent now, at least. In Northern Ireland, uh, it's on the island of Ireland, which is separate from the Ire uh, island where Wales and Scotland and uh, England are. It, the northern part has been owned by Great Britain, the United Kingdom, for a really long time. But on Ireland's island... There are Catholics and Protestants, and on the island where Great Britain is, it's mostly, mostly Protestants. And that religious conflict created serious, it then went in with like Irish nationalism and all these other problems to basically make southern part of Ireland Catholic and uh, in, in favor of having a single Irish country on that island. And then the northern part was mostly Protestant and in favor of remaining part of the United Kingdom. And as a result, these, the Catholics were fighting for political power because they were denied a lot of political power in the northern part of Ireland. And the Protestants fought to re, like keep that power for themselves um, and remain part of the UK. So here's what we're looking at in the Balkan Peninsula down here with the, the Croats, the Muslims, and the Serbs. And here you can see the red area are the ethnically Serbian zones. Um, the green that you can see in here is where there are people who are of the Muslim faith, and then the Croatians are down here in yellow. And this 
one area, see how complicated that map is? The Just the complicated part of that map led to some calls for a more systematic, like splitting off of people, like keeping these people separate from those people and these people separate from those people. And that conflict led to a thing called ethnic cleansing, where you try and either force people out of an area if they're of a different ethnic group than you, or you kill them so that you can make one area a single ethnic group. And that was some horrible atrocities that took place during the 1990s. The culture of Europe has spread to lots of different places in the world, and that's because Europeans did exploring, colonizing, and imperializing. And we're going to talk about those individually. Uh, Europeans started to explore the world in the mid-15th century, and the first European countries to explore were Portugal and Spain. Um, they were looking for a route to Asia so they could buy stuff there and also sell stuff there, but really with spices, because Europe... Um, spices, silk, porcelain, and other things that came from China and from India, these are really hard to get in Europe, and it's really easy to transport stuff by sea, and uh, their routes into uh, Asia were being not entirely blocked, but a lot of the money siphoned off by this empire called the Ottoman Empire. So they're trying to find a way around this big, powerful um, Islamic empire, and so they looked out into the world and found stuff they weren't expecting. And what they found was, you know, North and South America as part of this, and then also that they could take control of regions way far away from them and use it for trade. So they started colonizing those places. And colonization is when a group of people from one country settle in another country. And mostly they settle there to gain benefits for the mother country back home. So here's some areas that were colonized by various countries. Portugal colonized Brazil, Timor, Mozambique. Uh, Brazil is in South America, and that's their largest colony. Mexico, Central America, and South America, as we learned, were colonized by Spain. France got colonies in Canada and the Caribbean. And the United Kingdom got Canada, the United States, places in the Caribbean, Australia, New Zealand. The United Kingdom ends up having the largest empire. And the Netherlands had South Africa and places in the Caribbean. So here you can see the British Empire. Or sorry, the Spanish Empire. Here you can see the Spanish Empire. And... Spain, right here in orange, and then red is all the colonies they controlled. See, they also controlled lots of little pieces of Europe as well. They were very powerful at the beginning of colonization. And then here you can see the Portuguese Empire in green. They controlled uh, the areas in green around the world and then had trading ports in all of those purple zones. Here you can see the Francophone world. So these are places that France controlled on various levels at various times, but... Um, they speak French there in significant enough numbers to be considered part of the Francophone world. Francophone, speaking French, get it? Yeah? Okay. So you can see that they also had colonies in Asia, though um, that's important for us in the United States because that's where we fought the Vietnam War. Imperialism is separate from colonialism because imperialism is when a country takes over another country, not just an area, um, but a whole country, and has it be part of a major empire. Um, European countries took over countries and regions all over the world, and they did this so they could control resources and also compete with other European countries who were doing the same thing at the same time. It was made possible by the Industrial Revolution because European countries had access to uh, industrial weapons and technology and transportation stuff and also industrial production of goods, which you can do much cheaper than doing it by hand. Uh, the Industrial Revolution was a period of time from the late 18th, as in the 1700s, uh, to the mid-1800s, when machines replaced human labor in Europe. So they were able to do so much faster and stuff much cheaper. The most important machine invented in Europe was the steam engine, because using the steam engine, they could make trains and steamships and better mining equipment and better weapons, and this allowed them to take over other parts of the world that Europe hadn't been able to take over before. So it's one of these examples where technology results in significant political and economic changes and totally reshapes the face of the world, and in this case, it meant that Europe took a bunch of stuff over. And as a result, their culture is everywhere now. But that's all for this slideshow about the cultural side of stuff.